Okay. Okay. Um, good evening, um, everyone, and irrespective how you're following us on Zoom uh, through the community's Facebook page or um, on, on, on our YouTube channel. Every, there's only 24 sleeps left to go until stage four of the lockdown will be removed. So we're here every Thursday to keep you both um, entertained, but also academically stretched as well. So until the end of October, uh, every Thursday at 7 p.m., you can dial in to listen um, to these um, seminars. Um, just some bit of housekeeping. For those who are following this seminar through Zoom and have registered, um, you'll be able to communicate with me um, through the chat function. And just before the seminar is about to finish, I will put in a request for anyone um, who has any questions to ask uh, of the speaker, just um, type, type them through and, um, the, and then we'll answer them uh, at the end. Um, not too many other sort of household, household items apart from those. Okay, um, let's make a start. It's been quite an eventful and strange year, um, one that, we'll never, that we will never forget in our lifetime, and one that will become a year of reference when we discuss and refer to things in the future. And given that we're in the midst of a pandemic, a 21st century pandemic, it is no surprise that we've also gravitated to this theme in our seminar series, not only to remain topical, but also to put context around things. Our next two online seminars, tonight's by Dean Kalimnio, and next Thursday is by Costa Maras. Both have a pandemic theme. Then we'll look at pandemics in antiquity, while Kos will examine how COVID-19 has impacted migrant communities. And judging by recent figures, the virus has taken a disproportionate toll on the elderly of the Greek community. Well, I'm not too sure what to say about tonight's speaker that hasn't been said before, considering I've introduced him on numerous occasions and what's also been said by others. Uh, Dean is probably the only speaker that not only has presented every year of the seminar series, and that's more than 10 years now, uh, but on, on most years, multiple times. Being the polymath that he is, there probably isn't a topic under the sun that he can't present with authority. And we all have to thank him for keeping us academically both challenged, entertained over the years. At times, I think to myself, with all the writing that he does, with all the time he spends on social media, with all the presentations, book launches, et cetera, that he's asked to do, with his growing family that he needs to attend to, where does he find the time to research and work on his legal cases and clients? He does have a day job, I presume that's what pays the bills. Would I trust him if I had a case? Would he spend enough time on it? Or would his mind be wondering on his next article or presentation? But then I have a reality check. Nick, don't be an idiot. If you want something done, give it to a busy person. That's Dean. Um, as mentioned in the abstract of this seminar, uh, during times of pandemic, conspiracies and snake oil merchants, proffering cures, proffering cures abound. The lack of knowledge during antiquity in the Middle Ages left the field clear for, for char charlatans to peddle their wares, preying on the hopes and fears of a hapless and frightened populace. One might say, What's changed in today's information overload world where science has progressed in leaps and bounds? There's still charlatans peddling miracle cures and conspiracy theories. Dean's talk will focus on one of these uh, charlatans or covidians using Dean's terminology, Alexander of Abonotikos. Abonotikos was an ancient city in Asia Minor on the Black Sea coast. It was later renamed Ionopolis and today resides the modern-day Turkish city of Inebulu. Alexander formed a cult around the worship of a new snake god, the Lycon. He was a charlatan who played on the hopes of simple people. He was said to have made predictions, discovered fugitive slaves, detected thieves and robbers, caused treasures to be dug up, healed the sick, and in some cases, actually raised the dead. Need I say any more? I'll leave the rest to the enigmatic Dean Kalimnia. Let me switch over to Dean, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Nico, for that fantastic uh, introduction. I'd like to reassure my legal clients that I actually do spend time on their cases. Um, that might assist them because I can see them now departing in droves. Um, 
But tonight we're not talking about legal issues. We're talking about Alexander of uh, Avonotichitis, uh, who, and the reason why we decided to pick this topic is because not only has the pandemic hit us quite hard, but also it's also exposed fishes and interesting cultural phenomena within our community. And one of those is the rise of the conspiracy theorists, and there have been a few uh, popping their heads from our community in social media and uh, also um, in public uh, and achieving notoriety. And uh, the argument is that this is a phenomenon which is not new. It's an old phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that we can find in antiquity. And uh, tonight, the journey that we'll take will hopefully uh, underline a few points about the fact that the way that we deal with crises and the way that we deal pandemic with pandemics, uh, which always come around once in a while, uh, as we can see through history, is often the same, uh, which then uh, leads one to ask questions about our understanding of social evolution and uh, our aspirations um, in that regard. So let's see if we can do some sharing of screens. Um, hopefully that works. And uh, yeah, um, we did mention that, uh, Nick mentioned the, the uh, term uh, COVIDiots, COVIDiots, um, people who possibly um, act in a silly way when there are pandemics. Uh, and of course, uh, COVIDiots could also be the cutting off of an ilithio if it's about to uh, engage in uh, one of those uh, idiocies. Now, Pandemics have been with us since ancient times, um, and it follows logically that there would have been ancient equivalents of COVID idiots uh, even before the term uh, was invented. And one of these undoubtedly would have been the ancient world's most brilliant and yet unknown charlatan, uh, Alexander of uh, Avonotichus, uh, seen here um, in the guise of the god Asclepius. Now, I want to say a few things about how we know about this guy. Um, because he really exists uh, outside of the common uh, Greek historical discourse, uh, which is a shame. Um, and we learn about him mostly through the writings of an ancient writer, Lucian of Samosata. And we need to say something about him because he deserves, I think, a lecture in his uh, own right. He was an ethnic Assyrian uh, who wrote in Greek. He was a satirist, uh, rhetorician, um, who's best known for characteristic tongue-in-cheek style that he had, um, and he frequently re ridiculed the superstition of his age, religious practices, uh, and the belief in the paranormal. Um, his language, his native language was Syriac, and a dialect of uh, Aramaic, um, but all of his extant works uh, were written in ancient Greek um, during the second sophistic period. Uh, he was probably a traveling lecturer and visited universities throughout the Roman Empire, um, and after acquiring fame and wealth through his teaching, uh, he settled down in Athens for a decade um, where he wrote most of his works. And we believe that in his 50s, um, he picked up a highly paid government job as an official in uh, Egypt, after which point he disappears from the historic record, probably because uh, he had made enough money to retire and not draw further attention to himself. His works were extremely popular in antiquity uh, and more of 80 writings have been uh, attributed him to the uh, present day, which is a lot more than other uh, more famous classical writers. Um, his most famous work is The True Story, which is a tongue in cheek satire about uh, authors who tell incredible tales. And we believe that it is probably the earliest work of science fiction. He talks about interstellar battles, battles between the stars, it is really the first Star Wars. Move over jo, uh, George Lucas. Lucian of Samosata is uh, the man who uh, invented the genre. And uh, his dialogue, Lover of Lies, makes fun of people who believe in the supernatural and contains the oldest known version of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, which was made famous by the Disney cartoon, of course. Um, he loved to pick on people. He loved to, uh, as we say in Australia, take the piss. Uh, of public figures such as the cynic philosopher Peregrinus Proteus, and his pet hate was the man we're going to discuss tonight, Alexander of Avonotikos, uh, and he wrote a treatise called Alexander the False Prophet, which is why we know about this man, primarily 
through Lucian, as we've said. Now, Alexander, as uh, Nikos in his introduction explained, uh, was a native of uh, a city called Avon Pichos, the wall of Avonos in Paphlagonia, Paphlagonia on the Black Sea. I think Paphlagonia is absolutely the best name for any place. If I could choose to come from anywhere, it would be Paphlagonia. I'd love to be a Paphlagonian, even though in history, everyone who comes from Paphlagonia gets a bad rap, whether they come from ancient Paphlagonia or Byzantine Paphlagonia. The Byzantine Paphlagonians are horrible people, take it from me. Uh, and that's probably why this man, um, Alexander, eventually was able to successfully petition the Roman emperor, um, as we shall see, to change um, the name of his city to Ionopolis, uh, from which the Inebolu comes. And you'll see the X up there, X marks the spot. That's the area that we're talking about just before Pondos. So to the left of Pondos uh, is that area where he comes from. Now, he was a snake oil salesman like uh, no others. He plied his train by working uh, in traveling medicine uh, and in shows around Greece, uh, professing to affect miracle cures. Somewhere along the way, he received some form of rudimentary uh, instruction on medicine from a doctor who, according to Lucian, uh, was also a quack and became sex, uh, successful enough to uh, establish an oracle of the healing god Asclepius in his hometown. Uh, in uh, about 150 AD, we're talking Roman times, where he became renowned for his skills in healing the sick, but also prophesizing the future, uh, much like a modern televangelist, we would say, but of course, without the private jet. Now, between approximately 160 to 190 AD, we know from records that a great plague swept through the Roman Empire. Now, According to the Australian sinologist and historian Raf de Crispini, uh, who's researched uh, notices of uh, plague in the Chinese records, which are extensive and uh, are very long and continue from that period until today, this may have originated in the Eastern uh, Han Empire. So again, from China and slowly slept, uh, swept westwards. And it's held by many that the uh, outbreak of the Antonine Plague in uh, 166 coincides with the Roman embassy of Da Qin, which is a Chinese word for the Roman Empire, landing in Zhaozhi in northern Vietnam uh, and visiting the Chinese court of the Emperor Huan, claiming to represent An Dun, which is a transliteration of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, or possibly his predecessor Antoninus Pius. So there is a station of this plague and of a Roman embassy preceding it um, in the Chinese records. It was a slow and uh, inexorably devastating process, which was described by the Greek uh, physician and writer Galen, Galinos, uh, which is why it's also known as the plague of Galen. Um, Galen was uh, summoned by the emperors. Um, there were two emperors at the time, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. He was present at the outbreak among troops uh, stationed at Aquilia in the winter of 168 to 169. Now, Galen briefly recorded his observations and a description of the epidemic uh, in his treatise uh, Methodus Medendi, and he uh, scattered other references to it in his uh, voluminous medical writings. Uh, he describes the plague as great, of long duration. He may have even mentioned the word unprecedented for Victorian viewers. It was uh, characterized by fever, diarrhea, and pharyngitis, as well as a skin eruption, sometimes dry, sometimes pustular, that appeared on the ninth day of illness. Obviously, it was something that would create great distress and suffering in people. Now, we don't know exactly the nature of the disease by the information provided by uh, Galen, but scholars believe it may have been smallpox, um, but its effects were extremely devastating. That's without a doubt. Um, the total death count has been estimated at 5 million and the pandemic killed, some scholars believe, although this is not certain, one third of the population in certain areas. But we do know that the Roman Empire was absolutely, the Roman army was absolutely devastated. Uh, it caused irreparable damage to the Roman maritime trade in the Indian Ocean. And that's been proven by archaeological record spanning from Egypt uh, to India as well as significantly decreasing Roman commercial activity in Southeast Asia. 
there were, just like today, economic consequences to the, that pandemic. Now, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius mourned the devastation of the pandemic and its effect on civil society, stating that even the pestilence around him was less deadly than falsehood, evil behavior, and lack of true understanding, because he was a philosopher, and eventually uttered as his dying words, weep not for me, think rather of the pestilence and the deaths of so many others, if only our current political leaders could think in those terms. But where he saw death and suffering, Alexander of uh, Avunotikos saw opportunity. So he decided to draw on uh, traditional Macedonian snake worship. Um, snake worship was a part of Greek religion from the early days um, and announced at his oracle an imminent incarnation of the healing god Asclepius uh, when people gathered in the marketplace of Avonotikos at noon on a particular day when the incarnation was supposed to uh, occur, Alexander produced a goose egg and sliced it open, revealing the god within, uh, in the form of a snake. Uh, within a week, this snake grew to the size of a man with features of a man uh, on its face, including long blonde hair. Uh, what in actual fact, according to Lucian, the resourceful Alexander had done was created a very skilled, elaborate sock puppet uh, called Glycon, uh, the sweet one, the sweetie, uh, who could guarantee anxious women fertility in time of uh, pandemic, which was always an issue. Stress uh, combined with suffering uh, causes disrupt disruption in these uh, patterns. So women seeking divine intervention in order to conceive would bring offerings to Glycon, the sock puppet, um, though Lucian implies that uh, Alexander, who was the keeper of the cult of Glycon, had less magical ways of causing pregnancy, giving a new nuance to the phrase, put a sock in it. Um, as an interesting aside, uh, chickens are often infected with parasitic gut inhabiting uh, worms, uh, including the roundworm Ascaris lineata, which is a nematode species like tapeworm that can grow to a few inches in length. And these are often passed out of a bird's gut uh, when it defecates. So unlike in mammals, the bird's gut and its reproductive system share a common external passageway and opening. So sometimes the worm ejected from the gut finds its way into the bird's reproductive system rather than being excreted into the outside world and moves into the oviduct. Uh, there, it becomes trapped in the albumen of the egg uh, and it remains alive and yet trapped when the egg is laid. But as soon as the egg is uh, broken open to be eaten by an unsuspecting diner or for display uh, in uh, Alexander's case, the worm wriggles its way out and inevitably gives the diner a bit of a shock. Um, these days gives rise to legal action, um, who frequently assumes that this figure is a tiny snake. So some people question whether this is the snake inside the egg phenomenon that Lucian describes was actually this, or could the egg actually have been a genuine snake egg, which uh, Alexander passed off as a goose egg. Um, I think the second is more likely, but at the end of the day, a magician never reveals uh, his secrets, does he? Um, so not content with uh, making babies, uh, Alexander soon discovered that propitiating glycon was a much more effective method of staving off the pandemic than masks, social distancing, lockdowns, and self-isolation. Um, so he sold magical rings with uh, glycon's uh, image on them. You can see one there. Um, and he also purveyed magical verse derived from the omniscient glycon, which if he told everyone was inscribed upon residential properties would protect people from the uh, ravages of plague. Uh, as Lucian of Samosata wrote, he revealed uh, thaumaturgic verses, which he dispatched, these are Lucian's words, um, to all the nations during the pestilence, and they were to be seen over doorways everywhere. And we know from archaeological evidence that they were spread throughout the Aegean into the broader Mediterranean. Uh, an inscription from Antioch in these times uh, records the words, Glycon protect us from the plague crowd and plague cloud. And this, 
even before the advent of uh, 5G, my friends. So amazing stuff. And you can see a uh, votive figure of Glycon here with his long blonde hair, uh, his anthropomorphic uh, features. Um, a god to be worshipped. I think that if anything can prevent, protect us from COVID-19, uh, Glycon certainly can. But sock puppet cults will only go so far without the uh, support of the establishment. And it is here that our hero, Alexander of Abunotikos, uh, became extremely lucky. Sometime in about 160 AD or thereabouts, the governor of the province of Asia, uh, Publius Mumius Cicena Rutilianus, I love that name, uh, declared himself protector of Glycon's oracle and later decided uh, to buy into the family franchise by marrying Alexander's daughter. This was, I think, a sound business decision because while he was dispensing pandemic protection, Alexander would uh, sit in the shrine uh, with his sock puppet wound around him, giving uh, autophones or random unasked oracles. Uh, as for specific questions, so you could go to the oracle and ask a specific question, will my grandfather be saved from COVID? Um, will my wife still love me after the self-isolation is over? And because Cora right now she I can't stand the sight of me. Um, will my kids ever learn anything through um, online learning and everything else that may occur to you uh, while you're facing a pandemic? Um, these kind of questions were answered by Alexander through Glycon in rhymes. And in his most profitable year, he delivered nearly 80,000 replies uh, for the bargain price of uh, one drachma and uh, two uh, ovoli, which I think. Uh, is a sound uh, money-making machine, a gold mine, if there ever was one. Uh, he triumphed in the face of economic adversity. Now, according to Lucian, uh, his devoted followers uh, believed that he made predictions, that he discovered slaves that had escaped, uh, that he was able to detect thieves and robbers. He was able to find buried treasure, which is always important, um, healed the sick, and in some cases, actually, was able to bring back his bring back people's loved ones from the dead, which was handy if you had perished before you had the chance to write or inscribe glycons, uh, salvific verses uh, on your front door. Um, Lucian asserted that it was either a sock puppet that Alexander was using, or it was a real snake, snake's body, a tame snake, possibly a python or another type of tame snake. Um, but the talking head of Glycon that actually gave the predictions uh, was not the snake's real head. Uh, he claimed that that was hidden under his armpit, but was instead an artificial construction made from linen and skillfully manipulated by Alexander using a lengthy internal tube uh, composed of conjoined bird windpipes that led out from the false head, from the false head into a hidden chamber where an assistant spoke words into the tube, thus making it seem as if Glycon was speaking. Now, Lucian further alleged that a series of fine attached horse hairs acted as internal pulleys to make the false head open and close its mouth and extend and retract its tongue. Other authors believe that he wore a mask and that um, he was manipulated by other means. Be that as it may, one would ask the question, how does Lucian come to know all of this? And we'll get back to that later because I think it's an important point. Um, how much did Lucian know and why? How much was speculation? How much was it sour grapes for someone making more money than him? And then he goes off and reveals the magician secrets, just like so many people did to the poor Yuri Geller. Now, the skeptical Lucian, who by this stage you will have all gathered, didn't really like Alexander very much, uh, also alleges that he became adept at opening sealed inquiries. So you'd go there with a sealed inquiry, which they would open up uh, in front of you um, by heated needles, forging broken seals and giving off vague and meaningless. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're looking at, uh, question to the oracle. Uh, and then he would open that up and answer it on the spot. 
Lucian believes that he would open them up beforehand and have pre-prepared answers. Um, if the inquiries were of a particular sensitive nature, uh, he'd be able to blackmail uh, the inquirer and predict them and uh, as a result, gain more money that way. And it is interesting to note that according to Lucian, always, um, his investigations into Alexander's practices led to attempts on Lucian's life, uh, purely as a means of asserting copyright and trademark uh, rights, of course. His main opponents, apart from Lucian, seem to have been the Epicureans and the Christians. He didn't like them very much. Now, Lucian's account of Alexander represents the Christians, as we said, along with these Epicureans, as special enemies and the principal objects of his hate. The Epicureans had too little religion and superstition to give in or take seriously any religious pretender, and the Christian faith was too deep-rooted uh, to dream of any communion with uh, Alexander or deal with him in any way whatsoever. So not that Alexander cared. Um, being exceptionally famous as a mystic, um, he utilised Rutilianus's uh, own eminence to help launch a very spectacular annual three-day festival, kind of like a Republican Party convention in America, replete with processions, ceremonies, and reenactments of all sorts of religious rituals, all held at his special shrine of Avnoticlus. Um, these were devoted to the celebration of Apollo's birth uh, and that of his son, uh, Asclepios, the appearance of Glycon, um, Alexander's own mother, uh, he said, supposedly married Asclepios' uh, son, Podalirios, uh, so that Alexander gave himself a divine provenance. He believed that he was the grandson of the healing god Asclepios, and that there was even an alleged romance between Alexander himself and the Greek moon goddess, Selene, which uh, purportedly led to the birth of Alexander's daughter, now the wife of uh, Rutilianus. So we're going into um, cult territory here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just as the Moonies in uh, South Korea uh, ascribe divine uh, attributes to their leader. So did uh, Alexander buy into the divine franchise. He was the son of the, he was the grandson of the healing God. Uh, he had an affair with the moon goddess and his daughter was the uh, daughter of a moon goddess who just happened to marry the most powerful man in the province. I think in terms of positioning, uh, it's absolutely brilliant. But sadly, for all of uh, Alexander's adroitness, uh, Glycon the sock puppet did not confer protection against plague, and the governor of Cappadocia, an adjoining province in Central Asia Minor, was apparently led by Glycon's oracle to his death in Armenia. And of course, this was in the age before disclaimers and negligence, so he got off scot-free. Now, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, uh, who wrote in his various meditations about the necessity of keeping a level head and keeping yourself free from superstition, he was very big on that, but he was also sucked into this cult. Uh, an oracle uh, was sent by his request uh, by Alexander to the Roman army on the Danube during the war with the Marcomanni, who were a Germanic tribe, directing that um, victory would follow on the throwing of two lions alive into a river. And the result was complete and utter catastrophe for the Romans. And the unflappable Alexander avoided loss of credibility by spinning uh, his ambiguous oracular pronouncements in the opposite direction, he said, I said that victory would occur if you threw the lions into the river. I didn't say who would win. And he actually got out of it, scot-free. It's brilliant. Now, because one of the effects of that pandemic was military instability, um, according to the fifth century Spanish writer, Paulus Orosius, many towns and villages in the Italian peninsula and the European uh, provinces lost all of their inhabitants um, as the disease swept north to the Rhine. Uh, and what we see here are columns in, in Rome, um, which represent the uh, wars of uh, Marcus Aurelius against the Germans on the Rhine. 
Uh, it also infected Germanic and uh, Gallic peoples outside the empire's borders. There was no quarantine then, but even so, even if there was, they probably would have missed it because there were uh, lacks in their uh, hotel quarantine procedures. Uh, for years, uh, those northern groups existing without the borders of the Roman Empire had pressed south in search of more lands to sustain their growing populations. Now, with their ranks thinned by this pandemic, the Roman armies were not able to push the tribes back. So there were important consequences, uh, social, cultural and political consequences and demographic consequences as a result of this pandemic, which Alexander was purporting to cure through glycon. Um, from 167 to his uh, death, Marcus Aurelius personally commanded legions on the Danube, trying with only partial success to control the advance of the Germanic peoples across the river. Uh, a major offensive uh, against these Marcomani was postponed to 169 because of a shortage of imperial troops. And uh, Alexander was not able to assist in any way. But Neither the defeat on the Danube nor the 5 million estimated pandemic deaths served to diminish uh, devotees' faith in their beloved sock puppet, even after Alexander died in his 70th year, um, mysteriously neglecting to Glycon, mysteriously neglecting to warn him that he would contract gangrene at the time. Instead, he became so mainstream that in 20 BC, he was referred to by the Roman poet Horace in his first epistle to Mesimus. You despair of the muscles of the invincible glycon. So he becomes mainstream. He becomes, uh, if you like, a meme, a public figure, something that everyone is comfortable with and familiar. He's ubiquitous, uh, like a bad video on TikTok, for example. Now, not only was the cult of Glycon not discredited despite its failure to stem the pandemic and uh, Alexander's sharp practices, but worship spread from the Danube to the Euphrates. So we're talking about the whole length and breadth of the Roman Empire. Uh, with the Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius even striking coins uh, in honor of the sock puppet. And you can see them here. Uh, Pius Antoninus is there. Um, Glycon, with his uh, long hair, is on the other side. Um, he's on the official currency of the Roman Empire. Um, and these coins, by the way, um, remained in circulation uh, right up until the third century AD. That's a particularly long period of time. Um, Glycon has also appeared in currency. Oh, there's another one um, where you can see him there. Um, the emperors are there. Um, this coin is written in Greek. You can see Gassard here with the lunate uh, sigma. Uh, and uh, Glycon appears uh, there uh, entwined in his own uh, curls and self-contradictions. But he's also appeared in currency in the modern era. Um, here is a Romanian 10,000 lei note in 1994. Uh, and you can see Glycon in the middle there. And the reason why he's portrayed there is because in that year, a 4.76 metre long ancient marble statue uh, of the great sock puppet god Glycon uh, was unearthed in uh, a railway station in Costanza. Uh, and another one, so there it is there. Um, that's from Roman times. It was unearthed underneath the railway station. And another one was unearthed in the city of Domis, also in Romania. So for some reason, in these marginal areas of the Roman Empire, away from the center, Glycon was considered very important. He, his cult continued. Uh, he was worshipped as a healing god and as a protective familiar spirit, um, remarkably. And yet, again, we know uh, memory of this god has escaped the modern Greek narrative on the ancient world and probably uh, for reasons that are obvious. Now, given the prominence of snake cults as uh, healing divinities in the Mediterranean uh, and surrounding areas, and uh, both before and after the rise of glycon in the region, 
Um, the spread of the cult continued for some time following the death of Alexander and uh, the various movements of the Roman armies on the Rhine, as we said. Now, some evidence indicates that the cult survived into the fourth century. So around about the time that Constantine was legalizing Christianity and then making it the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire, people were still in various parts of that world worshipping the sock puppet. Um, he even has modern day adherents, believe it or not, um, following his coming out, if you like, in inverted commas, uh, as a magician in 1993, the English comic book writer and occultist Alan Moore has declared himself a devotee of Glycon. Here we have Glycon appearing on Romanian uh, postage stamps. Uh, I think we need to do this uh, in Greece as well. We want Glycon on the stamp. I think that's important. He will scare uh, the enemies of Greece away. Um, there's another coin uh, where Glycon is actually portrayed with a halo, uh, believe it or not, which is interesting. Now, so Alan Moore, the comic uh, book writer, has declared himself a devotee of Glycon, uh, preferring belief, as he says, in a hoax deity because he's not likely to start believing uh, that glove puppets created the universe or anything dangerous uh, like that. Now, Alexander of Abonotichus, possessed of dashing good looks, apparently he was extremely, extremely good looking, uh, and that is possibly one of the reasons uh, why he was able to attract crowds. Good-looking people always do, um, as I've learned through my marketing for Dummies book. Um, good looks, mind-blowing charisma. Um, televangelists and other cult leaders eat your heart out. Uh, he had all the answers. He was the archetypal cult leader of his day. Like certain other modern cults, he was also able to persecute his rivals and those who didn't believe in him and those who doubted him and those who tried with logic to disprove everything that he maintained. So not for him, the mindless adherence to state propaganda, the giving up of his civil liberties, the entertainment of vested interests, or the refusal to see past the obvious and discern hidden agendas. With his sock puppet in hand, he conferred absolution and a sense of security to his adherents throughout the Roman Empire, basking in his popularity and raking in millions, even as millions perished. Now, the sociologist uh, Stephen Kent, in uh, a study of the text, compares Lucian's Alexander to the malignant narcissist in modern psychiatric theory and suggests that the behaviors described by Lucian of Samosata have parallels with several modern uh, cult leaders. And uh, the commentator Ian Freckleton has noted at least a surface similarity between uh, Alexander and David Berg, who was the leader of a contemporary religious group, uh, the Children of God. So an interesting insight, psychological in insight into a man who uh, certainly was able to influence so many people throughout the empire at a particularly sensitive time and when they're all vulnerable. Now, though his memory barely lingers, his practices and his abilities to capitalize prejudice remain perennial. Uh, one would argue a uh, cautionary tale for us all. Uh, in the words of Dave Matthews, the world and the universe are far more wonderful uh, if there is no puppet master. And yet here is a puppet master of uh, brilliance, a man who was able to influence so many people into believing at a time when people desperately wanted to believe that there were answers, that there were cures. And of course, the parallels with today are extremely striking. Alexander, as a historical figure, is a nebulous one. We have the coins of Glycon. We have the uh, magical verses that we found in houses in Antioch. But really, all we have in terms of tactics, understanding, background, history, are the writings of one man, Lucian, a man who was a satirist, a man who was an arch comedian, and a man who wrote books about lies. 
So the question that I'll leave you with is, was it all real? I mean, we can't argue that there was no glycon, but was this man a figment of Lucian's imagination? And even if he wasn't, and there really was an Alexander Avonotikos, was he the way that Lucian describes him? Or are we in fact looking at a marvelous literary invention? Here is the lesson. Uh, Dean, um, thank you very much. Um, as always, um, you didn't disappoint and hopefully we'll have a, a few questions from the floor by our followers um, on Zoom. Normally there's a backlog of questions, but um, they appear to be a bit shy today, but first one's come in from Dr. Um, Sosdakias. Was Alexander more involved with myth or propaganda? Well, look, as I say, we only know about him through the writings of one brilliant, funny man. So the question is, um, does, did he exist did, or did he act in the way that he's said to have acted? Was, it, was he a charlatan or was he a man who served a cult and uh, was picked on by a brilliant satirist for his own reasons in order to satirize religion, which is what he did. Uh, Lucian uh, specialized in making fun of religious beliefs superstitions. He may have seen Glycon and attributed a, uh, a whole history behind him that actually wasn't there. Although one would argue that there were possibly rumors, innuendos, oral history, um, a whole culture around this cult that Lucian was able to possibly use in order to write his history. Uh, we need to critically read the texts rather than accept them at face value. But even if we do, it's still, I think, a brilliant story and one where Lucian provides huge psychological insights into the human condition in time of crisis and pandemic. Um, Dean, during that time that um, Alexander lived, that's sort of talk about the first century um, AD, what were some of the other, um, let's say, renowned or famous cults during that sort of first century? Do you know by any chance? Or? Yeah, well, look, you're, you're looking at a time when there is extreme religiosity. Remember, the empire itself is changing. There are barbarians on the borders. There are incursions. There are mass po uh, movements of population. There is a renaissance Persia, which is becoming extremely aggressive. The empire is stretched to the limit. They are fighting battles on all fronts. And there is a feeling of insecurity. And during this time, religion becomes much more syncretic than what it was. Uh, Isis, the goddess Isis, was extensively worshipped throughout the empire, especially in Greece, uh, something that modern Greek neo-pagans don't like to admit, but it's true. Um, and also um, gods from the east, like Mithras. Uh, Mithras was a Persian god. Um, his uh, cult was, uh, was revolved around the killing of a ritual bull to ensure um, the recreation of the new day. At one stage, just before um, Christianity took off, it was possibly the most popular religion in the Roman Empire. And we find Mithraea, the, the myth, uh, myth, these temples of Mithras all around the empire and in Greece itself. Um, I've got a question from um, Ian Nidis. Uh, are there any references to Glycon by early church fathers, Epicurean, Stoics, etc.? As far as I understand, we only know about Glycon through the writings of Marcus Aurelius, Roman records, and also um, the uh, inscriptions in Antioch and the writings of Lucian. I don't believe that there are any writings by the church fathers on Glycon. I could be wrong, but I'm not aware of any. Uh, nor from Epicureans? Or... I'm not aware of any. Not aware of any, okay. okay. Um... Well, someone's just also answered that question, and no, there aren't. And um, yeah, okay. Um, any more questions from the panelists? We still have a bit of time. Okay. Um, you've perplexed them tonight, I think. And uh, so I've perplexed <laughs> myself. Um, just one of those. <laughs> Topics that are far out there, you know, um, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, and I think that we really need to idolize the Greek charlatan. 
Um, it's a very important cultural tradition. I know that at the start of the pandemic, there were certain uh, Greek politicians who were uh, in Greece purported to have cures for pandemic and were selling them online or people were attributing um, claims to them that they could do so. And it's, it's a cultural tradition that I think goes back to Alexander, this idea that we have the answers, that we're able to do certain things in order to propitiate plague. Uh, and of course, the panic, the vulnerability, all these things set in. Uh, people want answers, people want to believe in things. And when they don't, when the uh, usual institutions which provide surety, security fail them, then often they look elsewhere. And uh, Alexander, if we believe Lucian, was able to capitalize on this spectacularly, make a huge amount of money. Uh, Dean, um, how did you come across him? Because even someone who might be sort of well read in sort of ancient history, um, it's really a peripheral figure. It's, um, very few people probably come across him or know about him. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I love Lucian. I love Lucian. I worship Lucian in all his forms. I was always convinced that Assyrians have no sense of humour. Uh, I base this on my connections with the modern Assyrian community. Uh, I think modern Greeks, uh, in terms of their humour, are a bit lacking as well. Lucian is this melding of two modern non-humorous traditions, but stemming back to the ancient times, an Assyrian who wrote in Greek, was immersed in the Greek world, was on the periphery and yet within the centre, Remember, he came from the periphery of the Greek world. He was in Samosata, which is in modern-day Turkey on the border with Syria. Um, but he spoke Greek. He was part of Greek civilization, but he viewed it from the outside and the inside. And he's able to take the piece of every single cultural phenomena existing in his time. And I think that's brilliant. Uh, I've become obsessed with him. I first got to know him through his brilliant work uh, in his uh, early rendition of Star Wars, where there's a fight in space between planets and armies uh, involving various vegetables. It's really funny. I encourage everyone to read him. And it just goes on from there. He was, I think, possibly the funniest ancient author within the Greek world that ever existed. Uh, so beginning from there um, and then going forth uh, into his other works, uh, yeah, I, I, I love him. And uh, in answer to that question, it's just popped up. Yeah, my favourite one is the, the Star Wars, uh, the one where he talks about the various people uh, fighting in space. I think it's just brilliant. It's inspired. It's eerie uh, how the idea is so close to George Lucas's space opera. And to consider that someone in the age before all of these technologies could conceive of interstellar battles, albeit with vegetables, although one would argue that the new Star Wars series was written by vegetables, and I would agree with them, is really, really, really bad. And Lucian would be turning his grave if indeed he could, um, and he would be satirizing it. I think is brilliant. I think we all need to know about these people. There are heaps of authors out there, especially in the Roman world, who were not Greek but wrote in Greek. Favorinus is another, um, who are fascinating because they view Hellenism as it was, or Greeks, or the society as it was emerging from outside peripheral eyes. And these parallels can be drawn with the way we on the outside as uh, migrant Hellenes who have been born here or brought up here or view sometimes the Hellenic culture from the outside. We can draw parallels with these people. These people are our friends, our compatriots. Their message has an immediacy and a relevancy beyond their time for us. Well, food for thought for a future uh, seminar. Um, Dean, I don't think we've had one exclusively on Lucian by anyone, so yeah. Well, there you go. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> Okay, um, well, um, thanks very much um, once again. Um, and um, I'm sure we'll have you back before no time. And just a reminder to everyone listening, uh, next week's presentation will be a more sober presentation on the current COVID crisis and its impact uh, on the um, migrant community uh, in Australia. Um, thanks everyone for participating and following the seminar tonight. And thanks once again, Dean. Thanks everybody.